Great sleep to me is you fall asleep relatively easily. You wake up no more than once. Ideally, you don't, but uh, you know, a lot of people have what's called nocturia, which is nighttime need to urinate. So it happens. A couple of things that the, the path to a really great night's sleep starts in the morning. Wake up. If you want to be alert, get as much bright light in your eyes as you can. Never look at any light that's so bright that it's, it's painful to look at because it can damage the eyes, but ideally sunlight. So if you wake up at 4 a.m. and the sun isn't out, turn on bright lights if you want to be awake. And once the sun is out, go outside without sunglasses. And yes, you have to go outside. You can't do this through a window or through a car windshield and get some bright light in your eyes. It doesn't have to be beaming directly at you, but indirectly or in the general direction of the sun is good. Wearing corrective lenses or contacts is fine. Even if they have UV filters, that light can get to the neurons in the eye that trigger a whole set of processes. It sets in motion a big increase in cortisol, but it's a healthy increase that leads to alertness. Triggers an increase in body temperature, which is important for waking up. There's a whole set of processes there. And it sets a timer on melatonin release so that about 16 hours later, your melatonin levels are going to go up. How long to view light? Well, anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes, depending on how bright it is. If you wake up and you go outside and it's 9 a.m. and it's beaming bright light and you're on a snowfield, it'd probably take 30 seconds. If you're in the depths of, uh, you know, UK winter and you go outside and there's a lot of cloud cover, maybe 20 minutes. And you do that most days. If you miss a day, no big deal. If you miss two days, you're starting to drift. And when I say drift, I mean that these neurochemical systems are going to start to, to, to get out of sync with the daylight cycle. That morning light pulse is, I say light pulse, light viewing is immensely important. Um, a drift in cortisol peak toward the later day is a signature of depression and waking up at three, four in the morning and not being able to fall back asleep. You're gonna get a pulse and a, a big increase in cortisol at some point every 24 hours. You want that to be early in the day and when you want to be alert. If you wake up at five, again, if the sun isn't out, turn on as many bright lights as possible and then go outside once the sun is out. Why? Because early in the day, you need a lot of bright light in order to trigger this mechanism. Now, the second tool is that later in the day, as the sun is heading down, it doesn't have to just be crossing the horizon. You also want to get light into your eyes for the following reason. It adjusts the sensitivity of the what we call the retinal photoreceptors, the cells in the eye that detect light, and makes it such that nighttime light that you're going to get at 8 or 9 p.m. won't have as severe an effect on reducing melatonin. Getting that afternoon light is great because it sends two signals to your brain and body about where you are in time, meaning time is the rotation of the earth. So you get your cortisol pulse early, melatonin comes on. People who start waking up late or super early and they spend all their time on their phone, it's not enough light to trigger these mechanisms early in the day. But at night, retinal sensitivity is such that if you are looking at your phone on full screen brightness or you have a lot of artificial lights on, you're going to suppress melatonin and you start disrupting these mechanisms. Thousands of people have written to me and said, I get morning sunlight every morning as best I can, 10 to 30 minutes, and my sleep issues are resolved. Now, some people do that and their sleep issues are not still resolved. I would say, then you look to how late in the day are they ingesting caffeine? Do they have a kind of rumination issue? Are they eating enough? I mean, one thing that is not commonly discussed is that in order to sleep well, you have to eat enough not necessarily right before sleep. And nowadays there's a big movement towards don't eat within two hours of sleep. And I think it's generally a good idea. Sometimes I obey that, sometimes I don't. But if you don't have enough starch in your system, sorry, low carb keto people, but if you're gonna have sleep issues unless you do other things to offset that, because starches and the whole association with the tryptophan system and the serotonin system are part of the calming system. There's a reason why we reach for certain so-called comfort foods when we're stressed is because they increase the release of serotonin and they blunt cortisol. So if you're just a bag of cortisol and adrenaline and you're fasting a long period of time, it's very hard to, st to get quality sleep. You need to figure out how much to eat and when to eat and what to eat in a way that still allows you to transition to sleep. So I'd say the light viewing early, the light viewing in the afternoon, avoid bright lights of all colors. Blue blockers are fine if you like them, but it's not just blue light that can mess up these circadian clock systems. Any bright light any bright light will do that because of the spectrum of, of wavelengths of light that the neurons that are responsible for this respond to. Then I would say there are some things to do around sleep. You see, if you're experiencing a lot of emotional turmoil, that's a problem. Ideally, you're getting enough movement during the day that you're a little bit tired. I mean, you're supposed to fatigue yourself a little bit each day. I will say that about an hour before your natural bedtime, everyone experiences a kind of peak in alertness. 
us. This is from um, Chuck Zeiser's lab uh, at Harvard Medical School. Has shown that there's this, this spike in alertness about an hour before your natural sleep time. And the just so story is that this was designed to get you to uh, run around and, and tidy up and shore up your, your, your surroundings for safety. So if you are experiencing a lot of pre-sleep anxiety, just realize that that naturally passes after about an hour. And I think that can help a lot of people. Some people do very well with supplementation for sleep. And this is, I've been very active in promoting this because I saw a lot of people taking sleeping pills, prescription sleeping pills. And I, I can't believe that this many people rely on sleeping pills. It's crazy. Um, first of all, drinking alcohol or, you know, or THC to, um, before sleep will get you to sleep in many cases, but the sleep is of very poor quality. A couple glasses of wine to help you fall asleep, your, your sleep sucks, frankly. You know, scientifically speaking, it sucks. It, you, it, you, and there's a whole set of other issues that you're creating there. The supplements that make a lot of sense um, scientifically are things like magnesium threonate, T-H-R-E-O-N-A-T-E, or magnesium bisglycinate. Both of those cross, they need a transporter to get from the gut to the brain. And um, threonate is actually shown to be cognitive enhancing in some studies of, of uh, age-related cognitive decline. Somewhere between 140 and 200 milligrams of magnesium bisglycinate or magnesium threonate. I should say 5% of people that I've heard from who take three and eight uh, get severe gastric distress. They, they get, get diarrhea, but most people don't. A lot of people do very well taking apigenin, A-P-I-G-E-N-I-N, which is a derivative of chamomile. Apigenin activates a different system, the GABA system, which tends to turn off thinking. Apigenin is 50 milligrams. A lot of people do really well just with the magnesium or just with apigenin. I happen to take both. And I confess that a couple of nights a week, I'll take um, you know, 300 milligrams of GABA or two grams of glycine on top of that. And it's like the sleep of gods. It's mm -hmm. really amazing. And the GABA glycine added in tends to create really deep, really long sleep. And oftentimes I don't wanna sleep longer than six, seven hours. If people are having trouble sleeping, they should consider, certainly do the behavioral things, but then um, consider you know one to three of those supplements. If you're not interested in the supplement route, the way I used to do this was to drink a cup of cut chamomile tea before sleep. And the apigenin in chamomile tea is a number of positive effects, but one of which is to make you feel less anxious and kind of calm down. You know, I don't know how much chamomile tea you have to drink in order to hit that 50 milligram concentration, but there's no reason it has to come from a pill. I do not recommend melatonin. Mm, I was going to ask you that. I do not recommend melatonin for the following reason. One, it's a hormone that has other functions besides helping you fall asleep. It interacts with the reproductive axis, estrogen and testosterone, not necessarily lowering or increasing, but there's a lot of dynamic slow effects in those systems. The other is that the dosages of melatonin that most people take are outrageously high compared to what the pineal spits out on a normal basis. You'll see dosages of like one to 12 milligrams. That's a huge amount. This would be the, you know, typically the male testes will uh, release anywhere from seven to 15 nanograms per day. This would be the equivalent of taking, you know, 100x that in the melatonin system. Melatonin just shouldn't be taken at, at excessive dosages. And it helps the transition to sleep, but doesn't help you uh, stay asleep. And then there's one last thing, which is theanine, right? Which is um, T H E A N I N E. Theanine is actually being packaged into a lot of coffees now and energy drinks secretly because it reduces anxiety. And so they're getting you to drink more coffee and more whatever uh, energy drink by trying to remove the jitters. Some people like theanine about 100 to 300 milligrams before sleep. Sleepwalkers and people who have night terrors don't take it. It makes for very lucid dreams. I've never found any dependence on these. Like if I forget them, I don't have trouble falling asleep. So it's very different than a sleeping pill. And again, I, I, I guess I do use a lot of supplements. My, my take on supplementation is they're just compounds like anything else. And if there's an opportunity to take safe, non-prescription, fairly low cost compounds, as opposed to a prescription, high side effect, potentially addictive or habit forming compound, why wouldn't I resort yeah. to the over-the-counter 